So anorexia nervosa, this is one of the most lethal, if not the most lethal psychiatric condition in our nomenclature. Some people now say that opiate addiction is rivaling it, but suffice it to say that there is an enormously high morbidity and mortality associated with anorexia nervosa. There is a new description of it in DSM-5. The word refusal has been taken out, and this is largely due to the implication that that's blaming people for not eating or gaining weight. Anorexia nervosa is a highly heritable disorder with heritability rates on the order of 0.5 to 0.8. So most of the variance is accounted for by additive genetic effects, which is contrary to popular belief in society and our culture. Sociocultural effects are not the primary cause in multiple twin studies. The other major source of the variance is largely individual or unique environmental factors which account for 0.35 to 0.45 of the variance. That's where trauma and adverse experiences during development come into play and which interact with genetic factors, whereas the shared environmental piece hardly accounts for any of the variance whatsoever. That's a big surprise to many people who attribute anorexia nervosa to primarily sociocultural factors. If that were the case, we would have a much higher prevalence of anorexia nervosa. First and foremost, anorexia nervosa involves a restriction of energy intake relative to requirements leading to significantly low body weight in the context of age, developmental trajectory, and physical health. Significantly low weight is purposely more arbitrary, but it's defined as a weight that is less than minimally normal and for children and adolescents, less than minimally expected. What is really important in diagnosing anorexia nervosa is to see the individual's childhood growth charts. It may take a little work tracking that information down, particularly if people have moved various places and seen a number of doctors, but contacting pediatricians and or family doctors to piece together the trajectory of where they were at birth and how they progressed in terms of their growth and development is really key to understanding what is quote-unquote normal for any given individual. There are specifiers whether one is in partial remission or full remission. I will say that it does take some time for people to get into true remission, and initially it involves normalization of weight or what is called nutritional rehabilitation, and the treatment typically involves adjunctive treatment by a dietitian who is versed in eating disorders. In the next slide, this is an overview of the pharmacological treatment history of anorexia nervosa going back several decades. There was one early study that showed lithium was effective. It was effective statistically, but no one uses it now clinically and I'm not recommending it, as it can be highly lethal, particularly in people who are starving or not drinking enough fluids, as well as in the binge purge type of anorexia nervosa. That's a setup for lithium toxicity. Pemazide, fluoxetine, and many people are surprised to learn that fluoxetine in low-weight individuals is absolutely ineffective. It was shown in this one study, which I'm going to show you to be helpful in terms of preventing relapse in weight-restored individuals with anorexia nervosa. Ciproheptadine is one older drug studied back in the 1980s that worked only in the restrictor type of anorexia nervosa. But olanzapine is really the major medication with an incomparable evidence base. There are six randomized control trials that demonstrate the efficacy of olanzapine either for weight restoration or psychological symptom improvement. Some trials show olanzapine and aripiprazole to be ineffective, but these have been in inpatient or residential settings where you've got a full court press, so to speak. You've got meal therapy six times a day. You've got constant nursing staff. You have psychotherapy groups going on all day and individual therapy and family therapy and so forth. And so in that context where you have a full court press, you don't see an advantage of olanzapine. You see it in outpatient studies 
where you don't have that kind of intensity of therapy. Several studies have shown medications to be ineffective, such as sulpiride, tricyclic antidepressants, and then a big surprise to a lot of you, fluoxetine does not work in non-weight-restored patients. And then in another study, restored patients who were also getting cognitive behavioral therapy focused on relapse prevention, it was no better than CBT alone. In the same study that I mentioned earlier, ciproheptadine was only helpful, at least statistically, but not so much clinically, in anorexia nervosa binge purge type patients. And before the advent of olanzapine, a lot of pediatricians and child psychiatrists would use ciproheptadine to treat anorexia nervosa. Zinc is something that can be depleted in the face of semi-starvation, which can add to the decrease in appetite. But anorexia nervosa is really a misnomer. It does not technically involve a loss of appetite. It's the anxiety, the obsessionality, and compulsivity that overrides the drive to eat. Patients will tell you that they are hungry, but too afraid to eat. The key points of this video include many medicines have been studied in anorexia nervosa, but olanzapine is the only agent that has shown any consistent clinical effect in multiple control trials. Pharmacotherapy for anorexia nervosa should be adjunctive to multimodal therapies.